I think for this year for our MLK Day was our lives begin to end when we become silent about the things that matter. So tonight we're going to talk about things that matter. The end of this, I want us to be able to walk away saying we, we didn't solve anything, because we probably won't. If we do, that's great. But I doubt if we will. And you may even walk away saying, well, we didn't get into anything really deep. And that's not the goal either, because we don't have enough time to get in deep into any of these areas of, of concern. But we want this night to just be a beginning of the conversation. And then we hope to have other conversations. No, we will have other conversations and hope for a larger audience later on um, as we talk about each subject individually uh, about once a month or once every two months where we'll go deeper into each area. So I want to introduce you to Joanna Collette, who is um, our executive director of Job Source, and what she says is the best kept secret in Madison County, the Central Indiana Community Action Program. Joanna, if you just wave. <laughs> I'm going to go all the way across. Um, next, we have Tammy Dixon Tatum, who is our newly appointed director of human relations for the city of Anderson. Hey. And you all know our, uh, our esteemed dean of the School of Theology, <laughs> Dr. James Lewis. And I've asked Angel Rodriguez to join us tonight to give us some perspective from a student's view on things that matter. And we have Stephanie Wade, our former prosecuting attorney, and who is now in the law firm of, oh, oh, you're gonna have to help me because I think I left my note over there, Steph. Howard DeLay Wayne Garrett. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and last but not least, Terry Thompson, who I have gotten to know this year and just have appreciated him so much. Um, he has already started a diversity committee, not sure if that's what you call it, but a diversity committee or folks who get together to talk about diversity issues within our school system. Our superintendent of ACS. Yes. All right. You all have an agenda there. You can, whoever would like to start, though, can start. We want this to be kind of a conversation, um, a little bit informal, where they will tell you what's on their mind. They'll share a little bit. They'll interact a bit um, as if they are at a coffee house or over dinner, <laughs> um, just to say what's, what's going on with them and what matters to them. And so you're listening into their conversation and then they will invite you. Basically, we investigate claims of um, discrimination in regards to education, employment, fair housing, or special needs accommodations. And we also do what we call tenant and landlord mediation. So if you're having problems, um, be it you're the tenant or the landlord, if you're having problems in that situation, then you can give us a call and we'll sit everyone down and, and talk about those things that matter to you and see if we can come to some type of resolution before you actually have to go into court. So the idea is to avoid court, court at all possible. Does that work? <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Hi everybody, my name is Stephanie Wade. I am an attorney here in the area. I was a deputy prosecutor for 10 years prior to that. I worked in Marion County for several years as a sex crimes and homicide prosecutor and here in Madison County as a major felony supervisor in uh, several courts. And also very, very proud to be a new adjunct instructor here at Anderson University in Communications Law 4000 meets on Monday nights. Very excited about that. Thank you to the staff here for uh, inviting me. One thing that um, just over my years of experience and especially dealing with criminal law and now being on the other side, a lot of people like to call it the dark side, I call it maybe it's a little gray, um, are, you know, the elephant in the room is, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, what do you think about Ferguson? You know, in August of 2014, there was a lot of civil unrest in Ferguson, Missouri over the death 
um, of a young man by the name of Michael Brown. And so as a prosecutor, I would get asked those questions a lot. You know, what do you think about that? What do you think about the civil unrest? How do you think the law enforcement community responded to that? And so my thought process coming into tonight was really bridging the gap between law enforcement and the community. I do believe that a lot of things that happened uh, resulted out of fear, resulted out of ignorance, because we don't take the time to have a conversation. Um, we often don't take the time to try to get to know one another and explore those areas. And, you know, the, the topic tonight is not meant to incite feelings of frustration or anger, but just to have an open and an honest discussion. And as I began to think about this and even look back onto the speech of Dr. Martin Luther King over 40 years ago, I believe his response was symbolic and very relevant 40 years later. And so what I've done is uh, cropped it out about a minute and a half of his speech that I'd like for us to listen to, and then we'll have a little talk about that. So if you excuse me, I'll go over to the projector, cue that up, and um, hopefully our sound is playing. Until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice in the process of gaining our rightful place. We must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our created protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is part of our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. I think the very last statement that we heard um, is very relevant for this conversation. He said, we cannot walk alone. This is not just an African-American problem, a Latino problem, a law enforcement problem. This is something that as a community we need to come together and address. Um, you know, one thing, being a, being a daughter of a, of a Marine, and he was also, my dad's a minister. I didn't get away with a whole lot. Um, or neither did my siblings. We, we walked a very tight line. But one thing we were always taught was respect. And so I think um, we have a, a responsibility as parents, as teachers, as pastors, as community leaders to teach our young ones respect, even when it's not popular, or even when the media um, is sensationalizing a lot of things that are going on. We have a responsibility to respond with dignity and respect. And that one thing that I just want to, that bears repeating, is he says, let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. So just because that's something that's, that may be displayed by the media, our response is not to respond in kind. But we must have an open and honest dialogue and not be fearful of one another and have conversations. I believe in respect for authority. I believe in respect for law enforcement. I have a lot of friends in the law enforcement community, and I respect them and the work that they do. They're on the lines, the front lines, every day. <coughs> You know, but we're not ignoring the conversation, but I think it's our responsibility to have this conversation and to work together because we, we, we cannot walk alone. We have to work together. I was born in Mexico um, to a, I'd say a very poor family. Um, however, in Mexico we were middle class, definitely middle class um, and somewhat privileged. Uh, unfortunately, my brother, when he was born, he had a uh, medical attention, so we, my parents opted to come here to the United States for the American dream, opportunity and all. Um, however, they were not able to come here legally, so they came here undocumented. 
Um, I was uh, had to stay back in Mexico with my brother. Um, uh, now I have two sisters, but they were born here. Um, so we had to stay back in Mexico. And then at the age of five, my dad came back for me and brought me over to the United States. Um, and at the time, I didn't know what was happening. You know, I just thought, man, I'm moving to the United States. We call it the North back in Mexico. Man, we're going to the North. And we were so excited. Um, but as I began to grow and understand more and more, I realized um, that my peers had many other opportunities and privileges that I didn't have and couldn't experience, um, simply because of the fact that I came across undocumented as well. I came across before 9-11, so coming across was much easier than it is now. Um, sadly, President Bush was trying to um, see it, that immigrants here in the United States had a pathway to citizenship. Unfortunately, 9-11 happened, um, and that wasn't um, able to happen. So as I grew up, I kept growing, I kept seeing differences between my peers and I, um, and then, you know, everybody's dream was to someday get papers, get a green card. Um, my dream was to get a license. That was it. And at the time here in Indiana and many other states um, in the United States, many immigrants were allowed to have license. Um, loopholes, of course, but were allowed to have licenses. Um, however, a year before I could have a license, um, that was uh, taken back, repealed. Most of everybody that had a license, um, my parents as well, their license got revoked. Um, so for the longest time ever, I had to drive without a license. Um, I had to drive around. I had to work without you know, permits. I was illegal, undocumented here in the, in the US. And I'm not ashamed. Um, everybody I worked with, everybody at my school knew that the Rodriguez family was undocumented. Um, we weren't afraid to be part of the community, which unfortunately, a lot of immigrants, Latinos, and other minorities coming from around the world are. They're afraid to speak out, to be part of the community. Um, we were lucky enough and privileged enough that our community accepted us. Um, they didn't see a difference with that, uh, you know, because we were undocumented. So, um, I had the privilege to come to AU, take a visit. Um, I loved it, and uh, I wanted to come, however, I was undocumented. Um, so I was planning on buying a ticket to Mexico uh, and studying over there. It would be much easier than staying here with so much uh, legal problems. Uh, however, a week before I bought the ticket to Mexico, President Obama uh, signed Executive Order DACA, a Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and um, that helped several immigrants who met certain requirements to stay here um, on a two-year basis, renewable for another two-year, um, if they met the requirements, of course. I met the requirements, um, so I got a work visa. So that's how I decided to stay here. I decided to attend AU, and I was lucky enough that the community and the people I knew uh, helped me get here to AU. Um, you know, first generation, my father finished high school, my mom finished middle school. So, that, you know, this is a whole new thing for me. First generation, the oldest, um, scary, um, very scary, but I made it. So, I had a happy ending, and I'm here, and I love it, and, you know, I have great people that support me, and, and, and I couldn't ask for a better place to be. However, what aggravates me and hurts is that there's other students like like myself who don't have the privilege, didn't have the opportunities I had, and who are much brighter and much more deserving than I am to be here. And sometimes I wonder why I'm here and they're not. So it's a very, very tough situation. Sometimes I see my family, I have cousins, they were brilliant, academically speaking, um, but because of certain things and this problem we're facing, you know, this broken system, everybody talks about it, um, she unfortunately couldn't attend a university. 
Um, thankfully, my brother as well um, is attending a university in California. So we're lucky and privileged enough, and it saddens me that there's still, you know, students out there that can live out this dream that, that I'm living. Unfortunately, they can't. Um, and that being said, what um, worries me as well is that this issue or this thing that matters very much has become a, a party issue. It seems to divide us, you know, um, especially this presidential uh, election. Some say crazy things, others don't say enough, whatever it is. Um, it's sad to see that this, this divides a lot of people, and I don't think that it, that it should divide people. Um, in fact, it should bring us together. I mean, we, we, we're all immigrants or descendants of immigrants, so I definitely think we should do something about it. And besides being just an immigration issue, it's an academic thing, you know, how well we treat uh, immigrants. Do we accept immigrants into our institutions or not? Um, I was the first DACA student here at AU, and it was a bit iffy on if I'm international or not. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, my brother, he goes to uh, California. California has that down. They have no problem with that. They have plenty of uh, experience with that. Um, and I think our, our, our country should um, have a policy that's more consistent. Um, either way, I think this issue shouldn't divide us. I think we need to have an honest discussion about poverty. Um, I think it's deplorable that 45% of our county residents in Madison County live at near or below the poverty line. And poverty has such long-term effects on our communities. And in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King, in many of the speeches that he made, um, he said that choices and opportunities are limited much more by economics than they are by race or other factors. And I think as a community, we need to take a serious look at how our choices and opportunities are affecting all of our citizens. And I think there's um, three points in that that I would like to make. And one is, I think as a community, we need to help our citizens understand what resources are available. There are resources available to help citizens, but so many, there's such a disconnect between where the resources are and the people who need to know about the resources. I think the second thing is once you know about the resources, how do you get access to them? It's not easy. If an office is here, but you have no transportation to get there, how, how do you access those resources? And how do we, as a community, help our friends, our neighbors in the communities where we live access those so that they can be on an upward mobility and not uh, be on dependency? And I think another third area is we have to understand that poverty is cyclical and generational, especially in our county. And there, we have to understand that sometimes in the world where we live, um, a bad day for us might be that our cable went out. A bad day for someone else might be they have no idea what they're going to eat tonight. They have absolutely no idea how they're going to pay their electric bill this month. And how do we, as a community, support the people, because we, under, we have to understand that even if we provide opportunity for them to make choices, because of the cyclical nature of poverty, there's, they're going to backslide. It is, it is sometimes a one step forward, two steps back. And we have to accept that fact and say, you know what, we are here for you to this day. I will go and I will ask people, well, what is job source? What do they do? Well, we think you're down there at work one, and I think you like maybe help people get jobs. Okay. 
That's a great answer. But that is sort of what job source was in the past. In the last year and a half, job source has strategically not only redefined their mission and what their roles are, which I why I say it's the best kept now secret in Madison County, is that job source actually has three divisions of it that nobody knew about. Job Source is a WIOA service provider to DWD, which means we help people with low income get education and training to find a better job. And oh, by the way, we work with employers to match you in the community. I'm really happy to say that over this last year through our reorganization, in the last four months, we have placed almost two people a day in employment around here, and that's a big deal. Uh, we are working as a team where we weren't working as a team before. We are teaming up with community people and we are teaming up with employers. So it's a new day on, on the employment side of Job Source. But the CCAP side um, of Job Source, the Central Indiana Community Action Program, um, we do weatherization and we do energy assistance. But the other parts of CCAP really hadn't done a whole lot of things. And so when I came in, we had some community conversations and we said, what are the needs of the people in the community? We can't do everything. We're one organization and we shouldn't do everything. But where are our strengths and what can we do? And we have created now um, under a new brand, which will be coming out in the next couple of months, five move initiatives. Move in, move around, move you, move beyond and move together. And we are desperately going after safe, fair, and decent housing. And we're working with the city and other groups um, and rehabbing housing so that we can provide safe, fair, and decent housing for people who want to own a home or need to rent a home. We're working to provide vehicles for people who, it's great if you get a job, but if you can't get there, how are you going to keep it? And so helping people with transportation. Our Move Beyond program is a youth program and we're piloting it with some camps for kids. You've probably heard about some of them. And um, Terry Thompson's been amazing and, and allowed us to use the schools um, a few times for our camps. And, our, and we're pushing our kids to move beyond. It was named that for a reason because they're very immersive and we're, we're trying to help kids experience things they've never ever been able to experience in their life before. Whether it's playing the violin, whether it's speaking Spanish, whether it's learning how to play tennis, learning how to do life-saving and swimming. We're, we're really trying to make a difference and expand those opportunities. And my passion is how and when can we create the conversation about poverty in this community and really bring all the resources together for people who truly want the American dream, who truly want to do better, the resources are here, and we as a community have to do a better job of making that available to people, working with the resources that are here, and embracing those families that live on your street, next door to you, in the road behind you, that go to your church, that you see on a daily basis, who are friends of your kids in school, and not just turn an eye and say, oh, I'm sorry about you, but how do we begin those conversations? My story is a unique one. Um, I, was, I went to school to be an educator, came out and was a police officer for law enforcement again. For a total of seven years, I got teaching job, got rift, got teaching job, got rift, you know, the whole drill. Uh, that's why I have such a soft spot in my heart for the teachers here at Anderson because of the pink slips that's gone on for years and years. But it was uh, back in 2007, that uh, I had the opportunity to be an adjunct professor for Anderson University at the flagship where I taught many Anderson Community School employees the principles, uh, legal principles for principles. So PLES for PALS. And uh, it was during that time that um, actually some of the administrators I work with today uh, encouraged me to apply in Anderson based upon my philosophies. And so my wife and I began praying about it in the summer of 2007, and it was in April of 2013 that I became an employee of Anderson Community Schools. 
as the principal of Anderson High School, and then a year later, um, superintendent. My job, I think, is very clear, and that's to make sure that I stand for something firm, which is, my philosophy is that all kids deserve an education. My passion is that all kids graduate. And so I say that, you know, you're talking about poverty, Joanne. Here's a great image for you. 87% of the children in Anderson Community Schools are on free and reduced lunch. 87%. One of the highest in the state of Indiana. And we have 26% of our population are special needs children. We take all of Madison County's high functional skills students. So I'm here to tell you, we'll never be an A school in the view of the state of Indiana under their current A to F system. And as I told the high school staff today, that's fine. Because, um, you know, you don't take away our special needs kids. So philosophically, um, I think it's my job to be the role model for the expectations. I made that very clear when I became superintendent, and it's this, very simple, that we're not gonna put kids on the street, we're gonna do everything we can to help them, and there are times we all understand or extenuating circumstances that that occurs. Uh, but I, I can tell you that we've been very fortunate in this uh, school system to have strong support from our board. Stephanie is one of our great board members, and they've allowed us to do some things that are very special. And some of those, Joanne started to allude to, um, for example, we opened a new building called Compass uh, one year ago. Two years ago, we opened our Career Center again. Many of you in this room knew it as the Ebert Vocational Center. It's now about, a, it's about careers, making sure kids have opportunities. Compass is a unique building because of what I just said, we don't want kids being thrown on the street. So Compass is an alternative site for children. Compass stands for Community Organizations and Mentors Partnering in Anderson Student Success. And so our goal of opening that building is we have 30 middle school slots, 30 high school slots, and they're for the children that I will say are not non-traditional students. They're not like us who have this passion for education. And I would believe the reason for that is a lot of their parents had some bad experiences in schools. As a matter of fact, we get parents coming to school angry before they know what the situation is. Why? Because of their experiences. So we put a lot of time, effort, and money into making sure our kids have places to go. So it's panning out. Let me give you a stat because obviously my passion is to make sure education is at the, the forefront because I believe when we're talking about prejudices and racial inequality, racism, sexism, it's about ignorance. And I think our guest speaker yesterday, Ashley Davis, hit it right on the head. And Stephanie was talking about that too. So the year before I came, 57% of the students at Anderson High School graduated. 57%. Uh, my first year, 90%. Now, I'm not, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not tooting my own horn. There was a lot of people involved in that, mainly the teachers. Because what we did was very simple. We identified the kids that were credit deficient and we provided them Apex credit recovery. And that's a simple thing you can do, but it takes money. The board allowed us to do this. The board allowed us to bring Compass into play. We provide kids with incredible teachers. The other thing we did one year ago is we hired two life coaches. We need four. We need two at, at one more at three elementary schools and an additional one at the other three. But we've satisfied with the secondary right now, having one at the middle school, one at the high school, because that's where the focus is on removing kids. So we used to, we had 75 expulsions a year before I came. My first year here, we had three. This year, at this time, I just looked at the stats tonight. 
We had zero first quarter at the high school and we had one second quarter. So that says a lot. Are there issues? You betcha there are. There are still a lot of problems. The major problem we have is making sure we have that pipeline between the school and the families. Thus, going back to our life coaches, we hired two gentlemen from this community. They're not teachers by trade. They're just good people who know everybody in the community. We hired Kojak Fuller, and we hired Pastor Samuel Jackson. And I'm going to tell you, um, that's a big commitment because here's two guys who are not educators. We hired them without grants. They're, they're hired as consultants. So we got to find funding. Anybody know of any grants? Please let me know. Uh, because we do have to, we have to find a place for them. They are vital. I'll give you a, just first week of school. Kojak Fuller and Samuel Jackson made sure six people stayed enrolled in our school. Six. Now, to you that may not sound like a lot. To me that's a lot. Because it's vital that we make sure our kids are in school. We can provide a quality education, Anderson Community Schools, 55 dual credit classes, credits. Kids can start college their sophomore year, which is awesome. Nine AP, six, uh, excuse me, five ACP classes. I say we're the best kept secret in East Central Indiana, but unfortunately, all it takes is one negative article, and then you take 10 steps backward. But I want to just share some things as if I were sharing with believers, faith communities, uh, because there are over, at least when I Googled it last night, there were over 44 plus churches in Anderson, in Madison County. And it could be very well more than that. But these are people who have diverse understandings of interpretation of scripture, uh, people who are different denominations. So you can probably understand that, there, that, that understandings about what it means to be human, what it means to be engaged, with the broader marketplace, those concerns may differ. The people of faith from different religious traditions, there's a long and storied history of involvement in politics that ranges from non-engagement, we don't want to have anything to do with that filthy system, to those who are almost completely assimilated, where their Christian traditions or convictions seem to have no distinction within the broader community. Uh, in other words, we're just like everybody else, they say. But I think the issue revolves around the fact that most Christians, positively speaking, have a lot to contribute to the ethos. Now, I'm saying this not because I'm standing here speaking scholarly about all Christians. Uh, but simply to say that there is something that we can learn from the tradition uh, of what it means to be people of faith. The critical question sometimes is not whether we will be involved, but in what ways Christians can be involved. And sometimes we miss this. Uh, sometimes we probably don't know and realize the extent to which our Christian convictions can have so much influence for how we understand uh, much about what happens in the public arena. Um, tonight's focus is about a positive role our faith can play in our public or common life, or what we often call the marketplace. And I believe, as I heard many of these persons speak, at least as I began to reflect on the Christian tradition, how do we display the love of God within the context of our common life. How do we display that great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself? And oftentimes, isn't it amazing that many times in our political arena, uh, that strangely falls out in the contentiousness that we often have toward others, even those who we say may also be in faith traditions. Displaying the love of God uh, in our rhetoric, in our civil discourse, how do we respond to the humanity of the person who's facing us? Love of God, love of ourself, love of the neighbor, even if that neighbor happens to be an enemy. 
even if that neighbor is a stranger. Now this is not disconnected from the scripture. Many of us say we read and, and we celebrate in our, in our worship experiences. But I think, for example, in the Old Testament, about the notion of gleaning. Uh, in the text it says, yes, this is your land. You harvest the produce. But the text indicates that as you harvest, leave something around the edges. Don't accumulate everything that you think you're entitled to. Save some around the edges for the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the enemy, for such were some of you. I delivered you out of Egypt. Remember who you are. Right. And sometimes it just makes me, I mean, I get really upset because I'm getting older, so I don't have time to always be on my best behavior. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes you do get sort of upset with how sometimes Christians respond uh, within public life. Um, we also need to demonstrate our affirmation of the humanity of our fellow citizens in Madison County. Affirmation of our humanity. And I heard yesterday that the, is the, the council or county, or wh whoever it is that passed the LGBT, uh, extending civil rights to the LGBT persons. Now, is that, is that right? I think someone said, well, we didn't have any arguments and we, we, just, we just signed it. But anyway, we do know that on the state level, the Senate bills and all of that, uh, if it hasn't passed, is definitely uh, attempting to extend civil rights to LGBT. Uh, but of course, you have the religious exceptions that are also part of that. What I'm saying about that is not to discuss theologically and biblically uh, the rightness or the wrongness of that, but simply to say, how do we meet another human being body to body insisting that we have a right to a good place to stay? That we have a right to food to eat and clean water free of lead, by the way. Uh, that we have the right to health care. That we have the right for employment. And at the same time, while we don't mind embracing those as our rights, why is it that it's so easy to deny the right to another human being? Now, whether or not one theologically or biblically may agree, but when we are in interactions with other people, we meet them first as human beings. Uh, king Lear, any king, goes around with their purple robes and their retinue following them. They are a king. But if you take them to the far recesses of the forest and disrobe them, we discover that we're all pretty much just alike. We have stories, but we must learn to somehow acknowledge the humanity of every human being. This whole notion, we need to deepen our vision of the possibilities, vision of what it means to be in community life. For example, uh, we use the term uh, illegal alien, or whether we talk about immigration, I think you talked very well about this whole notion. But in thinking about that, I could not help but think about another language, a language that can come out of the biblical tradition. Uh, it doesn't mean that all the problems go away and all the legal kinds of things go away, but it helps us to see the world in a different way. Uh, what is that? The virtue of hospitality. To learn to be hospitable to the stranger. And that word hospitality, when it is used in the Bible, is a compound word which means lover of the stranger. Hence we get our words hospital, hospitality industry, which reminds us that we're not here just for ourselves. We are here to serve others. Thank you. Thank you. All right, your turn. Um, I'd like for you to think about um, some of the things that have been said. And um, I guess one of the questions that I would have um, 
as we think about the things that matter and the different things that you all have talked about and have shared um, from your various areas of work, vocation, and then from your heart um, in some ways. When you think about the city of Anderson and, and what's going on here, what we're doing right, and the things that we could do better. What are some of those things that you see that you would comment on? As far as what is Anderson uh, doing right, uh, the panel members here, to me, this sounds like you know some of the great things that's going on in Anderson right now, like the superintendent said, the Compass program. I know firsthand about the Compass program. Before I came to the city to work, I used to work for the county. Uh, Madison County Juvenile Probation Department was where I came from. I actually did case management work within the uh, juvenile uh, department. So some of the kids that were on probation uh, were my kids that actually attended uh, Compass. So I was um, at Compass almost on a daily basis, um, checking in on my uh, kids there. I call them my kids. <laughs> so you, I, I got work kids, biological kids, and all kinds of kids. But at any rate, you know, to me, that Compass program is what we're doing right. And like you said, there's still problems, and there's things that we can do better. But that's the step in the right direction. So that's what Anderson is doing right. Um, Ms. Beverly, having this open conversation, that is what Anderson is doing right. And it will become better because of these open conversations. And just like Ms. Uh, Joanna Collette was saying, they started out with one initiative over there at Job Source. Now there's three, the move in, move out, move beyond, move, yes, five moves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in and out, yeah, all that movement. That, that's a great thing that Anderson is, you know, doing right. Right, Ms. Stephanie Waite. I mean, she worked in the prosecutor's you know, office, and now she's got this private practice thing going on. She reaches out into the community. She's a professor here now. That's wonderful. Those are, you know, what, these are things that Anderson is doing right. If it was up to me, you can go to every church. <laughs> and you can speak about you know, those things that you were saying, because a lot of times um, professionals um, are afraid. You know, a lot of times, because of the, the separation between church and state, people are afraid, professionals are afraid to say, I'm a believer, and my belief has me to act a certain way. And it's OK to be in the business world, but it's kind of really hard to separate the two. Thank you. My name is Sylvia Vogel. And I, you were asking, um, what could we do? And one of the things that I, I was thinking about as each of you spoke was things that we used to do years ago. And we all have the technology now with your phones, smartphones, and all the different types of uh, telecommunications. But doing like you said was talking and communicating with one another. And as Angel was speaking, you know, this country is built on immigrants. That's how, that's what we're made up of. And we sit idly by and say nothing about the politicians who continue to say nasty, awful things about uh, immigrants and about other countries. And, you know, everybody's just been kind of quiet. Years ago, we were never quiet. There was some type of demonstration or editorials. We used to write editorials about what was going on in our schools or whatever. Now we just do nothing. And that is a crime. We have to start speaking together. We, you know, I think the young lady yesterday uh, spoke about uh, the students who are demonstrating. Well, if that's what it takes, we need to demonstrate. But we can do more communication or sharing with our churches or with our uh, pastors. You know, a, a number of things, we can make a difference. We have a responsibility to the younger students and to uh, students like Angel to speak up and to share and be a part. And I promise to do that. I said a couple of weeks ago in our uh, Bible study session that, you know, it's time to just get up and stop sitting there not doing anything and just, you know, putting up with things and, you know, in our own personal lives and in this community. We can make a difference if we speak up and communicate with one another. Dr. Lewis, you kind of shared a little bit about hospitality and the stranger. And I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more. How can we move to a hospitable gesture to the, ch to the stranger to bring forth biblical reconciliation or reconciliation. And then for the panel members, 
I know that you all have climbed to your positions, facing some opposite opposition. How do you be hospitable when there's others that's totally negative towards you because of your ethos on poverty, diversity, black judge, Hispanic, black dean, and in politics? And what do you call hospitable gesture when you're dealing with your enemy? I think one of the, I think one of the I think one of the things that I've kind of learned over the years uh, since I've become more mature, age-wise, is not first of all to think the worst of the person I'm confronting, because that wastes a lot of emotional energy. I mean, I can I can say well, this person is being very uh, racist here, but is it really? I don't know. So I have to I have to kind of we have to be in a position where we learn to start a conversation, initiate a conversation. Uh, and, if, and along with all of this thing, if you ever think reconciliation or being hospitable in difficult situations is easy, you are delusional. We have to first of all say, it is tough work. But you can opt out of the process, or you can say, regardless, I'm going to keep on moving on. So I, I just stop at that as a way of saying, you know, I don't, I don't want to give in to cynicism and just simply say things will always be as it always is. Our foreparents, they were the kinds of persons that built their life on hope. That is, even in the midst of slavery, they were still having children. So in many ways, many of our parents, my mother and father had ten of us. And it wasn't always they had jobs, they didn't have the best educations. But that did not stop them because they believed in their God and their way of life was sustained by the reality of hope that tomorrow will be better than today. Um, how to remain hospitable to those who may not be so hospitable to you. It's interesting that you asked that question because I um, faced a lot of hatred when I ran for office recently. And coming from a small Midwestern town where I was looking through rose-colored glasses and Stephanie's the bubbly, loves everybody, I'll give everybody a hug person. When I encountered that, uh, it forced me out of my comfort zone. Um, you know, my dad's a minister, my mom is about four foot eight and is the most feisty person you probably would ever meet. And my dad is the reason, you know, let's talk this through. My mother is like, um, they're not gonna mess with my baby, you know, and so I had to balance, you know, um, you know, calling home and but it forced me out of my comfort zone, but it also created a closer walk with God because I went into my prayer closet about many things that I encountered. I thank God for the opportunity, um, but it does cause you to wonder why do people come out against someone who is pursuing a dream. Um, and, you know, it's so relevant to the conversation we're having today because many of us have dreams. And what I realized is that nothing is going to stop the plan of God for my life. Nothing. And that's something that even the people who spew the most hatred, that's true for their life as well. And so what it gave me an opportunity to do was to talk to people, to dialogue with them. But I prayed for them. They did not pray for them. But I prayed for them, but it forced me out of my comfort zone because I'm looking through with rose-colored glasses. It was hurtful, you know, things are either I, I wasn't black enough, I wasn't the right type of black because I was a prosecutor, or, you know, she's not from here, you're not, you know, you're not homegrown, and those are things that were said, or who is a little fluffy girl coming out of the blue <laughs> you know, running for office, who does she think she is? And it was almost like I had to prove myself on both sides of the fence. I had to prove that I was worthy enough to even be in the field. Um, people didn't know my background, my education, my family background, and to have that type of judgment, I, it could have driven me to a very bitter place. But it didn't, and I thank God for that. I don't have any negative uh, takeouts from that, but, you know, I, I praise God because my walk with the Lord has grown so much, and what it forced me to do, and what I love about it, is that I have come to know very many people in the community that I wouldn't have otherwise known. Um, 
to be able to minister to young, to young women, uh, to be a face, to put to a name. I love, you know, I think what each of us do in our, in our respective professions, you don't have to be in the pulpit to minister. I think what we do every day is ministry. And so whether, whatever God wanted to do with that process, he did it, you know, and it's going to move forward. The dream is going to advance regardless. That, that, you know, his dream for me might be something else, and I'm okay with that. But it's opened many doors just to have even a dialogue and to be more active in the community, something I love to do. So I'm still able to spread love regardless. You know, that's what I love to do. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was difficult because I had to balance that feisty side of me and then the reason side, and so I would call home a lot, and my, you know, I'm like, oh, I cannot believe, you know, the things that are being said. And of course, it was my dad was like, you call here one more time, you know, we taught you how to pray, <laughs> you need to toughen up, you need to have thick skin, and you need to move forward, you know. And that's what I did. But um, I thank God for that because God has a plan. He has a plan for each and every one of us. I think. Um all of your stories and the information that you shared is incredible and that we all should take away from here and try to spread it out to the community. Um, my name is Joseph May and I'm the son of L.C. May. And uh, my father started a business here in 1960 and uh, we're still in the same location even today. And uh, Dr. Lewis, <laughs> ever since I joined, uh, you know, with my father and, and, and uh, my brothers in the business and everything, we have always been concerned about uh, the churches here in Anderson and why they can't come together uh, to deal with a lot of the poverty that Joanne spoke about. And um, it's, it's discouraging because it's, it's, you know, we try to, how do you deal with, because I know you speak to a lot of these pastors here, uh, how do you deal with um, trying to get them all together <laughs> to even discuss the issues here in Anderson? Well, I, when I first came here about 20 some years ago, um, I was a part of a uh, ministerial group, uh, and the participation at that time wasn't very good. Um, what I kind of discovered too as being a new person in town that there was distrust among some of the members, among some of the churches uh, that, that was a kind of territorialism that this, that it doesn't mean that the people are just evil because they tend to act out that way but sometimes there are expectations on them from that denomination from their membership uh, and so we, we, we have a silo effect. Everybody is doing their own thing. Uh, I often say, and sometimes I, you know, I really am, I do get, get kind of embarrassed when I think about this. Uh, the church that I attend uh, is a parking lot over from another church and walking distance of maybe two or three other churches. And I sometimes wonder, what would it be like if our economics were certain, such that we didn't think that money was totally ours. Then what would it mean if, if, if my church, for example, that I attend, Sherman Street Church of God, would connect with Progressive Missionary Baptist Church or connect with Allen Chapel and out of our budgets be able to say, let's pool our money in a way because maybe we can get more done together than any of us can do separately. Uh, so I think that's something that we really think. I mean, you need to have the vision. You can only act in the world you see, one philosopher said. And you can only see the world you're willing to speak. And we need to speak another kind of way. See another kind of world. And I think that would be very helpful. It's amazing when you're coming from the outside in, and you truly have no idea I really didn't know Ollie was your dad till I, like four weeks ago. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy when your perception is totally changed. And while strangers and outside people are always welcome, sometimes what 
does need to be welcomed is, what is that perception? Tell me, because I'm not in your world, and I see things differently. May not always be a welcome comment, but sometimes asking different people creates different conversations. And I think that's the whole point of tonight, is everybody here who came is creating, there's going to be new conversations coming out of the question. So thank you for that. If I could, um, I've had great experiences with different uh, people from different faiths here in the community, but I've also had some experiences that I'm uh, disappointed in. You know, <coughs> excuse me. It was last May when I said, you know, we're opening this new building compass and we need to provide a food pantry on the west side of Anderson. And all I asked was for eight churches to come together and provide that, you know, one time a month you would have to serve. One day, one time a month. And to this day, there I know there, there are some great men still working on that. We haven't met that goal. And there are a lot of people on the west side that need help. And so we have the perfect building. People can walk to this location, but more importantly, we have children in that building, middle school and high school kids that need to earn the opportunity to dispense food to people because we gotta teach kids. It's not about handouts, it's about hand ups. Okay, can, I ask you, can I ask you a question, clarifying question? Uh, could you tell me how you communicated that uh, I'm just wondering, I, I can't say, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't. Um, the committee uh, with uh, Sacred Harvest Food Bank, put Tim Keene, put together a committee, and uh, Bill Watson was the leader of that committee, and they're the ones trying to get the churches involved. And I think they're getting closer. I, I guess, yeah, I good? just get frustrated. It doesn't go fast enough for me. I guess I've got that Manhattan mentality. I don't know why we can't do it in October, because this spring we're going to do a garden. The kids are going to plant a garden because they need to learn how to grow things so they can give them to the community. So I'm just so excited about what we can do, but I need help from the churches. I was actually at that meeting. Um, it's, uh, it's not difficult to have those ideas, but it's who you ask to come to the table. Um, most of the pastors that were around that table were church, um, smaller churches all African-American churches, for the most part, that were at that um, table, and they are struggling to, you know, get by with membership because the communities that they serve are that percentage that we're serving with the students that have 82% students. So those are their, uh, the, their kids. So if they can't feed their kids at church, it's hard for them to think about feeding the community. So it's kind of we have to branch out and kind of look at some of the larger churches that may have the economics to be able to help and assist. I think that's part of the conversation. I think sometimes in our community, we're a little bit too proud to go across the bridge or down the street around the corner and say, hey, um, we need some help. And also for the other person to be saying, hey, I'm available to help. So there's a dialogue that's gotta be had in our community. I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity to say um, thank you to the, uh, to the superintendent and to the school system. Uh, I have three children. We've been in Anderson uh, 15 years. I have a sixth grader, ninth grader, and 11th grader. And yeah, Anderson Community Schools are an easy target. You know, ever since I got here, one of the probably the first conversations was don't send your kids to Anderson Community School, right? But, um, you know, thank God for whatever that was, that seed inside of me that said, you know, I, sh I should give this a shot, you know? And, um, so thankful for that. It's been such a positive place for them. And um, I have become one of the biggest fans of Anderson Community Schools. So thank you for your work. And um, it is making a difference. Thank you. I want to take this time to, to thank our panel for coming out tonight, for sharing from your heart, from what you do, and to show what we are doing here in the city of Anderson. As as we talked about before, there are a lot of things that are being done that's the right thing to do. Um, and many more things that need to be done. So I thank you for having this conversation with us. And um, my hope is that the conversation will continue. Well, thank you.